My name is Jenna Sullivan, and I'm here with Sati Yoga. And I'm also the founder of the Facebook group, The Art and Science of Teaching Yin Yoga. And I am here today with the wonderful Dr. Arielle Foster. She is a colleague of mine in the Washington, D.C. area. We both teach yoga in, in the metropolitan region. And she's also a physical therapist. And one of the reasons why I wanted to bring Arielle into the group today is to talk to us about hypermobility and Ehlers-Danos syndrome. She also is a founder of a Facebook group around that subject matter. Um, so I wanted to just kick this off to Arielle and let her share a little bit about her background. I know she shares um, some yoga roots with me through the Kripalu tradition, but also like me, she's an interdisciplinary practitioner and teacher. And I'm also curious how you ended up as a physical therapist, because if I remember correctly, you were a yogi first, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I just um, kick it over to you and let you share a little bit about that. Thanks so much for having me on. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so my bio is I grew up uh, with actually a fair bit of exposure to yoga in the 80s and the 90s. My grandmother was a yoga teacher. I went to the equivalent of a charter high school that didn't have a gym, so my English teacher taught us yoga. I had a music teacher who had come to the United States for a kidney transplant, and he and his um, wife were really key, I don't know, faculty, but like highly, highly involved in Yogaville. And I helped him mm. with his medical transitions and challenges. And so I had all this exposure growing up to, to yoga. And then even when I went to college, I had a really incredible Kripalu teacher. So right after finishing undergrad, I went to stay at the Kripalu Center for, at the time you could stay for up mm. to four weeks as a save as a volunteer. And um, I just really loved it. I was like so studious. I would take I would take notes every single class. I still have those notes somewhere. And just absolutely obsessed. I would take two classes a day, sometimes three. They weren't necessarily vigorous classes, but the it would be like a, a meditation and gentle flow in the morning, and then maybe a, a clinic or so at, in, at noon at lunch or a something about pranayama, and then in the afternoon. Uh, perhaps a more vigorous class, but by Kripalu standards, so nothing too powery. And I just absolutely fell in love with Kripalu. And I went to, at the time, you could do the 200-hour requirement. wasn't uh, widespread at the time. So you could do different shorter trainings. And one of my yoga teachers encouraged me to come to her like weekend-long training with the mm -hmm. American Sports Medicine Association. And so I did. And I started teaching yoga fresh out of college. I went back to stay at the Kripalu Center other, other times. And um, probably maybe for a total of three months there as a seva. And then um, and it had been teaching yoga all the time and did another uh, small training. And then did my 200-hour training at Kripalu. I did my 108-hour training here in the D.C. area with Willow Street Yoga. I did yoga for arthritis training, which is a 40-hour training with Stephanie Munoz. I did um, uh, another yoga therapeutics training and off the mat into the world, which is a 40-hour training. And I did my 300-hour training with, the, with a former teacher trainer for yoga works, so in the yoga works lineage. <laughs> so lots of All interdisciplinary of the stuff. Family now. <laughs> what happened along the way was about six years into teaching, maybe five, I injured my shoulder mm. and it happened actually after an Iyengar class with a, like a great local teacher. It wasn't the teacher's fault per se, but I remember we were in downward facing dog holding it for quite a long time. <clears throat> and I was such a, I was very poor and in my twenties and yoga was my side gig, but my not day jobs in the nonprofit world weren't also, also weren't exactly paying the bills too much either. So uh, I would go to take classes at the studios or the gyms where I also taught because then they would be free. And I was looking around the room and there were a bunch of my students in the room. And I just remember thinking, oh, I don't want to wimp out on this. I really don't want to hold down dog this long, but I don't want to wimp out. And so I held down dog for who, in retrospect, it felt like five minutes or longer. And 
I woke up the next day and couldn't lift my arm. Yeah. Wow. So I went to see a physical therapist and just within a couple of minutes, she knew exactly what was going on. And at the time, I lovingly referred to what I was going through as kind of a quarter life crisis. <laughs> I really didn't, didn't find the depth of satisfaction I was hoping for in the environmental nonprofit world. I found a lot of back and forth, a lot of politics, a lot of frustration, um, stuff that I think certainly now I would have the fortitude to stick with. Yeah, I have that the background time, too. Yeah. It's hard. There's so much passion and so little money and yeah. everybody's fighting. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I didn't see too much fighting, but I, I do know that there was this palpable feeling of one step forward, two steps back. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it felt... Um, it felt heavy. It felt depressive. It didn't feel like the way I could spend the next number of decades of my life, professionally speaking. So this physical therapist just sort of lit me up a little bit. And I was like, wow, I want to do that. And I, I thought of it like, wow, this is a skill I could use anywhere in the world that there are other humans around, maybe even animals. And <laughs> I, and it, I remember coming home from my day job often feeling defeated and coming home from teaching my moonlighting gig, teaching yoga, feeling excited. So the idea that I could find a, a day job that would propel me into some sort of uh, higher fusion with my yoga teaching, that that, that appealed. Um, that was a very long process, of essentially a five-year process for me to complete my doctorate in physical therapy. The doctorate itself is a three-year program year-round, mm -hmm. but the... Um, so it's more than a law degree, in fact, but the, um, the prerequisites took me about a year and a half and yeah, it was a really, and then of course the licensing after that. So not a joke, not a light thing. And I've now been working as a physical therapist for six, seven years, and mm -hmm. I've treated literally thousands, thousands of patients. I purposefully put myself in some pretty interesting clinics. Um, so I've worked with of course, in Washington, D.C., we've got some of the political elite, and I've worked with um, some very wealthy folks from the Georgetown neighborhood and also people who take four buses to mm. get to where I am to just get their physical therapy. So it's mm. never, ever a dull day. <laughs> now, do you specialize in yogis at all, or it's just anything that comes to the door? <laughs> so... I work, I have for the last five years worked at Georgetown University Hospital. And I, there's, um, there we are almost all general orthopedic okay. physical therapists. We also have some neurologic therapists, uh, therapists who work on um, more neurology based patients. And we have a couple of other interesting niches, but most of us are general orthopedic. And it, if I had a specialty, it would be like hip. And um, hip physical therapy, hip labral tears, as well as generalized hypermobility. I also see <laughs> patients privately, and I would say 80% of the patients who come to me privately are yoga teachers or dedicated yogis. Mm. And so is this how you started to get interested in hypermobility and Ehlers-Danos, or how, yeah, did you go, so how did you get down that route? <laughs> Well, it's pretty simple. They're de depending. So you and I don't play football, right? Mm -mm. <laughs> so no. We were never interested in playing football, most likely. We never had the, uh, I, I couldn't have personally conceived of myself playing football. We become <laughs> magnetized to, to skills that we, we may naturally carry or to activities that we may have some natural skill in. You know, I would... Um, it would be very difficult to take, you know, if you have a natural aptitude for mobility, you are much more likely to end up as a gymnast. You're much more likely to end up as a ballerina or a dancer, or you're much more likely to end up in a yoga class. So many of the people coming to yoga, a um, much higher percentage of the people coming to yoga um, than your average people off the street are, are hypermobile. Mm. Can you explain then what it is 
um, to be hypermobile. Sure. And then also the less common but increasingly um, mentioned Ehlers-Danos syndrome too. So we yeah. are all on the same page. Yeah. So, okay. First of all, normal is overrated. So that is not uh, in any way what I want to imply as yeah. kind of a gold standard, but there's a spectrum of uh, joint mobility that each of us have as humans. And, um, and it's based for the most part on your genetic collagen makeup. There is let's just call this average right in the middle and then just a little more mobility will eventually there's certain criteria you have to meet but put you in the category of benign joint hypermobility syndrome you could have joint hypermobility at you know from uh underlying physiologic makeup like your collagen mm -hmm. which would be genetic you could have um or physiological at the very least you could have an um a traumatic joint hypermobility or you could have like you've a traumatic example with that of that would be like a you've sprained your right ankle 12 times because you used to wear clogs right that <laughs> that could be that could be the the traumatic joint hypermobility that ankle is hypermobile you could also um have such an extraordinary variance in your collagen makeup in your fundamental ligament and collagen uh, makeup that you could be classified as having Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So Ehlers-Danlos syndrome presents in a number of different ways. There are at least four types, if not more, and not all of them have as the hallmark joint hypermobility, but they all have a variance in the collagen structure and it, it's pretty rare. So mm. I'm not, uh, I don't consider myself an expert in Ehlers-Danlos, but to the extent that somebody with Ehlers-Danlos shows up in my clinic or shows up in my yoga class and says, hey, this is what I got, here's where it hurts, then that is where I can assist. So you mentioned benign. Mm -hmm. That also sounds like somewhere along the spectrum it turns into a pathology. Is that correct? Or something, like when you think of things as benign, well, they're just how you are and that's mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> yeah. And then, then there's something that turns into a pathology where we start to be concerned about it. And because I, I guess I'm probably hypermobile, I can do some pretty wacky things. And I, I have a ballet background. Mm -hmm. And as one of my teachers has always said, you know, you, like you said, you magnetize to the things that you can do. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have stayed if I wasn't good at it. I right. would have been matriculated out. And that's kind of how it works. Um, so at what point does somebody who has, and, and I don't like this term average or normal either because I don't feel my capacities are weird, but I, I get that other people look at it and they go, oh my God, that would kill me. You must be <laughs> killing you too. And how much are we um, pathologizing something that doesn't need to be or catastrophizing something? Like in your opinion, and I know this is hard to answer, but how much of an, a problem should we really be viewing this? Maybe that's the question. Okay, so there's a bunch <laughs> of questions. I know, uh, <laughs> threw the hose at you. Jumped in there. Um, one, I'm, I try to be really careful with my language. And I've learned this, especially from working with people who are in pain. Mm. Um, it's often not helpful to, sell, to tell somebody who comes in with back pain, oh, well, actually, there's something going on your back, there's something going on your sacrum, and there's something going on your hip because tears will start to flow. Okay. It can be really overwhelming. Even though from my perspective as a physical therapist, it's like, yes, we're getting, like, this is my detective work and I'm getting to the actual root cause of the crime. Like it's, it's yeah. for me, it's very exciting. And, and I've learned to modulate my, my languaging very explicitly around that because it's not exciting to find out that you've got that like what you thought was discomfort in one area that was just sort of growing actually could have stemmed from two or three other body part challenges. So I'm really clear and careful in my language. And I want to make sure that like you, Jen, that you feel um, not, like I said, normal is overrated, but that you don't feel abnormal right. walking away from a conversation with me that you feel that you are, are empowered mm -hmm. and proactive. You have some proactive steps that you can take to um, both ameliorate whatever condition you came to speak to me about or 
see me about and to move forward to prevent other things from happening in your life. So to me, it's this concept of svadhyaya, the concept of self-inquiry and self-study, that if we choose to practice this yogic path, that we are willing to look in and know our tendencies, know our tendencies to be, some of us are quick to anger, some of us are drawn to drama. I just read Twilight last week, and it's all about like this, like brooding, really mercurial, like, like, I, I don't, I'm not team Edward. That's all I know. <laughs> like, I'm not into that kind of drama and thank goodness. But, but yes, I, I have other faults. So, or other um, weaknesses. And it's that process of, of looking into your, in, into your, the self inquiry, your, the study of yourself that may, um, if you can acknowledge that you do have some selective or generalized joint hypermobility that should empower you that should invite you to a more proactive experience on the yoga mat and should invite you to seek out more information to practice the the yoga of knowledge Mm -hmm. to figure out what really works for you what 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 practices will support your life rather than uh try to fit some external definition of what is yoga Mm -hmm. so do you think as teachers um because we're not in a position to diagnose. It's totally outside of our scope of practice. Um, you know, when we see something, so that now it's, now it's a, a question of um, how much of what I see is hypermobility mm-hmm. um, versus how much really is. So when I see people, because of my own experience, I don't see a problem because that's how I'm, I view the world through my own lens. Mm-hmm. Other teachers have less capacity and so they see problems where they may not exist or maybe they do and I'm not I'm the one that's not concerned enough um and I'm just using myself as an example but I I'm 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 curious about the how teachers relate then to students that come and have more capacities than maybe themselves or other people in the room and I don't I want to be careful that we don't shame them or, um, you know, mother hen them too much, because I've seen that too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, and it's just, it's a curious place to play as a teacher with this conversation in the gestalt of the yoga world. Um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I have, a, so when I first finished my doctorate, I, the first couple of years after finishing school, I asked for almost every single class, five times a week, six times a week, however often I was teaching, um, if you have an injury, if you have any body parts that you want to tell me about, and I worded in a way that invited people to let me know if they were pregnant or whatever, so it may not necessarily be an injury. Um, and I realized a couple of years in that I was probably putting myself in a place of potentially more harm and more um, elevating my status as to appear to have more power than I actually do over the goings on in a group class. And that made me stop asking the question. Mm -hmm. So I was putting myself in a place of like a bigger liability because if somebody says, oh, I have this injury, they tell me, and then I go teach the class anyway, and they get hurt, then my, my license is on the line. I, I actually think it's a really good practice. This is quite a bit of a side note, but I, I think it can be a really good practice for newer teachers to ask this question. Um, because if you don't have a health license, you don't have that particular liability. Mm-hmm. And the worst that can happen is a kind of the equivalent of a slap on the hand or a, a financial hit, but of course you should have yoga teaching insurance. The worst that could happen in my scenario is I could lose my license and therefore y- years and years of dedication of my life. That is not something I wanna play with. So I stopped asking that question. The other piece of the, the pie is that I started to realize that you, as a somebody who is assigned essentially uh, not to say that we as yoga teachers don't have any power over what we choose to take on and don't take on. We absolutely do. But for the most part, the way these these things work, I I started working a year and a half ago at a brand new studio. They sent me an email and they said, these are the four classes we want you to teach every week. 
these are the, the names of the classes and the names have never changed. I think actually one of the names has changed, but the others haven't. So um, the classes I teach are called like happy hour flow, <laughs> warm vinyasa basics, gentle yoga. So I am going to show up and I'm going to teach a flow class or a vinyasa class or a gentle class at those times. That's just simple truth in advertising. If you show up to a flow class, a level two flow class, and you have never been to a yoga class before, and you don't have the upper body strength for a push up, much less chaturanga, which requires a more precise thing, I, there's, I can't change that in the next 50 minutes right. before Shavasana. I'm not gonna be able to affect your strength. I'm not gonna be able to give you the attention that you deserve most likely to really understand everything that's going on. And it's, it's, um, it's actually a relief to, to remind myself that in the capacity of a group class that I'm not there to fix anybody. I'm not there in any kind of therapeutic capacity. And to, for other people to put that on me is, is not actually appropriate. Um, I even had somebody come to my gentle class who I don't think was appropriate for gentle class. Mm. He was in a chair or he needed to be in a chair. So I brought the chair out. Um, and as I started instructing, I had told him prior to the class starting, stay in the chair. And as I started instructing, he decided he was going to try to get on the floor and guess what? He fell. Mm. And I, you know, I'm not going to take responsibility for that. I literally went up and I, I sent an email to my manager right after. And I said, I, I'm going to let you know that it's my professional opinion that this person needs to be in a chair class. I don't get to control who comes to my classes, but I want to let you know that. And I'm going to put it in writing right this moment mm. that, that, that he fell during my class. Like this is what I would have to do at the hospital anyway. So I'm very, very <laughs> trained in this way. Um, and then another example is last night, there's a student who's been coming to my class for a long time. And last night her hips popped loudly multiple times during mm. class. And it was really, uh, to me, that's a sign that there's, there's a hip instability. Like it's not a diagnosis or pathology. It's a hip instability. She may not have a pain. She may not have awareness that there's something going on there, but it will happen that it will become a problem if she doesn't address it what's my role in telling her well yeah. she wasn't around when class got out yeah I, I i mean there might be a moment where i catch her in the hallway and i'm like hey come over here i have something to to that i want to talk to you about but she's not there to be under you know she's not there to be my physical therapy patient mm. and vice versa yeah. So I, I, I think when it comes to teaching group classes, it is not our responsibility as teachers to um, intervene therapeutically with students. Mm. Um, so somebody comes in and they have a lot of mobility. Well, I'm not teaching deep, deep splits. I'm not teaching hyperflexible classes. I'm teaching strength-based classes for the most part. And really almost entirely. And if someone chooses to do something that is at the extreme of their range of motion, well, I haven't actually taught that. Mm. So, yeah. So do you think that, um, you know, this is a group for yin yoga and we yep. close this. <laughs> yeah. And so we get a special little side eye <laughs> from from people who worry about um, hypermobility. Mm -hmm. um, and the answer is often, you know, we can, we could debate stretching or not. And that's, that's like almost its own other conversation about what's going on the physiological level with stretching or not as, as, as we're starting to see too. Um, but the, the charge is always that, Oh, nobody with hypermobility should do yin because it's just going to make it worse. Um, in my own experience, it doesn't because when I don't do yin or anything, I go back and I've lost all of whatever gain I may have made anyway because I'm, I'm an old person <laughs> that's shriveling up. Um, but so, so we tend to fall back on this conversation about, well, people need to listen to their bodies and they need, you know, we talk in yin about going to the edge but not beyond. And we signal that the edge is a is a, a felt thing it's a it's a 
It's something coming into our sensory nervous system around pain or discomfort or, or general tugging or, or, you know, the sensations that we feel in poses. But I've also heard that people who are hypermobile or maybe it's, it's we have to wait until we get further along the spectrum where um, there's less pain sensation than in people with these conditions than the normal quote, air quotes, population. And so if we're telling everybody to listen to their bodies and, and pull back when they feel uncomfortable sens sensation, is it true that they're not, they may not be feeling something that could be harming them? What do you think? Absolutely. This is true of any yoga class or any athletic participation period. So if you are a yoga teacher um, or even, heck, a running coach and you rely on the student self-report of discomfort or pain, you're, I think you're, to some extent, abdicating your responsibility. That doesn't take away from what I said earlier, that like if it's a group class, it's not necessarily your responsibility <laughs> to be therapeutic to people. But you, you need more skill than, than just um, offing the responsibility to the student. And there's multiple like practical reasons for that. One of them is that there are endorphins flowing anytime you're engaged in physical activity. And those endorphins, in, like from uh, the endocannabinoids, can, they're literally um, masking your interpretation of pain in the moment. So there's a biological evolutionary reason for that. So there's um, physiological responses within your body that make it really impossible to um, listen to your body. So that alone is not an appropriate uh, and practice. That doesn't mean that we are not there for self-inquiry and for listening and paying attention. We absolutely are as students. Um, so it has to be a piece of what's going on, but it could, can't even be 50% of our what we're relying upon. I think we have to discuss, if we're going to get into the weeds on, on yin yoga and what could be helpful, what could be harmful, I think we also have to discuss what yin yoga is. And what I know yin yoga, I just want to make sure that, that it's the same thing that, that you know, because I've done classes on yoga glow, I've done classes in real life, but I haven't done that many. Most classes I know that are labeled yin, ask the student to use minimal numbers of props and essentially position your body in a way where gravity will slowly uh, lengthen some very deep layers of tissue and theoretically around the joints to create more mobility. Mm -hmm. And that also within that, there's an expectation that there will be just some discomfort. Is that? Yeah. So <clears throat> I have to fall back on one of my teachers who describes, um, and, and this is a slippery slope. And, 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 you know, I just came off of a weekend of teaching yin training and we mm -hmm. talked about the sensations and how to gauge. Um, so there's, there's, and this is true of anything that we do, there's inevitable discomfort. I feel inevitable discomfort when I go to my hit class and do the kettlebells. I, I feel tremendous discomfort running, which is, <laughs> makes me not want to run. So there's, you know, there's, there's exertion, there's feelings that come up from, from doing things that are non, that take your body out of non-neutral shapes. And then there's pain. And some of what we can do with that practice is to, <laughs> is to find the, the right, balance of sensation that's going to be inevitable when you're doing more than just lying flat side note not everybody feels comfortable lying flat either mm -hmm. <laughs> versus um you know pain that you sh that my teacher always calls risky and then she will even take the extra step of describing risky sensations so people have a, a better map of of what to compare their experience to um, and then, and then there's, you know, I, I teach um, uh, Mankowski's pain scale <laughs> to some of my students. Like, on a scale of 1 to 10, what do you feel? And if it's more than about a 3, I tell them to, to back off. Um, and then there's facial expressions. I've, I've, 
I do this in my regular yoga classes, not in too. But this, this still coming back to this question of, you know, pain is, is and discomfort and, and where that line is, is, is so amorphous. It changes all the time. When I'm having a hormonal moment, it feels different than when I am not in a hormonal time frame. And so, you know, there's all, you know, if I'm mentally drained, I feel discomfort differently than if I'm feeling more robust in my life and my personal life is good. I can tolerate more, you know, this, this moves around all the time. So it is, it is a question in Yin is like, I think, I think the reason why that gets emphasized is because we're trying to make a distinction between yin and restorative. Mm -hmm. so if you look at yin as an adjective along a continuum, you've got um, yang, where we expect to be holding plank and, and not like it, but we'll do it because it has benefit. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we've got restorative, where we prop so much that we're supposed to be floating on a cloud pillow, <laughs> you know? And so we're, we're trying to pit the yin practice somewhere along this continuum. Personally, I practice closer to restorative and I teach a little closer to the restorative end of the spectrum. But I know there are some because that's everybody's personality. They, they trend a little closer to yang in terms of level of sensation. But I often will experience in a, in a restorative class because you, you hold the poses for 10 to 15 minutes even at the 15 minute mark, a restorative pose for me will often turn into a yin pose if, if sensation and detection is the measure. Because eventually a, a restorative pose will start to, to feel something no matter how propped I am. So, uh, you know, it's a continuum and, you know, low loads, long enough time, even lying on my back, I won't feel comfortable after a while and I'll, I'll come out of that. So that's, that's kind of, and not everybody is, has the same level of training that I have in the yin and, and who knows <laughs> um, where people get the things that they say, but that, that's, that's kind of the spectrum. And so the idea that if we are, we're using sensation to know mm -hmm. if we're targeting the right area and they're actually doing anything to our tissues. And, I, and then there's another conversation around whether or not doing that to our tissues is a good thing anyway. So um, keeping, this kind of, keeping this back to the, the sensation as a marker. Yeah. Um, so I hope that fills in <laughs> for you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So using sensation to understand what your edge might be, where your edge might be, and using the pain scale, it falls under the same exact category as listen to your body. Yeah. The, uh, I use the pain scale all the time for physical therapy. It's the law, uh, <laughs> the rules in, in some places where I've worked. And I, um, it's highly, highly problematic. So I have people who will tell me they're an 11 out of 10. <laughs> and, and I have people who tell me it's a one or a two. And I'm like, hmm, you've been here, you know, you've got... 12 sessions lined up what I wouldn't line up 12 sessions for one or two out of 10 pain. So it, it's, it's again, highly um, open to interpretation and subjective and is not a quantif. It seems quantifiable because it's zero to 10, but it's not actually quantifiable. And again, it's dependent on the same sensation um, reaching your brain, but if it's a new sensation, so I would, uh, or a sensation that you don't get exposed to that often, no more than once a week or something, I, I just don't think that that's in any way reliable. Okay. You cannot, again, depend on students to, to tell you. So the other thing that's happening within the context of all group fitness classes is a pretty heavy weight of history that our educational system descends from, for the most part, this British education system that as human beings were trial let me go back to the British education system being one about punishment, mm -hmm. severity, um, <clears throat> stay on this path, the teacher is the authority. Um, and it's a very controlling system. This came, this filtered down through India. It filters down today through modern group yoga classes. My own classes probably included within that. There is a, a person in authority who is the teacher who is telling the rest of the room what to do. And as humans, as tribal people, uh, a tribal 
species, we have always relied on some level of authority, some level of leadership to make decisions, collective decisions for us as a group. So we as a species are also really vulnerable to hearing somebody tell us what to do and then doing it because not doing it has really negative social implications. Mm. Just like the injury that I got in my shoulder, it was, it was a, it, about ego for sure, me not wanting to look weak in front of a group of people that I wanted to impress on some level. But it was also, even if that hadn't been the case, I probably still would have hurt myself just because there's a person who I trust that's another factor that comes up with yoga teachers. We're deeply trusted, probably have more highly trusted than most medical professionals, which is <clears throat> frankly ridiculous, <laughs> but it's sad, um, but true. And, and we're given uh, way more authority many times than we truly deserve. We're given authority over other people's bodies. Mm. And I think within that context, it is just really, really impossible to... Um, to rely on the self-report of any individual experiencing pain or potentially experiencing pain. I do agree with you that most movement practices are going to require some level of awkwardness, discomfort, exertion. I say that all the time in my yoga classes, like we're practicing some pretty awkward shapes today and in practicing this <laughs> awkwardness, we are, we're we're intentionally being mindful. We're intentionally bringing our minds to a place of calm and equanimity. And that will hopefully transfer off the yoga mat so that when we show up and we face the mm -hmm. challenges and the awkwardness of everyday life, that we can show up with a practice that allows us to embody more gracefulness, more kindness, more equanimity, no matter the drama that arises. If it's okay, because that, well... One more piece about that, and then I'd like to switch to like actual joint mechanics mm -hmm. and, and describe what I think is going on in, in Yen. But the last thing I want to say about the inevitable discussions, discomforts that come around physical um, activity is I think Yen is very, very different from other physical activities in that <laughs> I, I think that our... I don't think that there's a point in the history of human evolution that we have ever practiced yin yoga. That so we've always been runners, we've always been hikers, we've always been crawlers, we've always been, you know, having to contort ourselves into funny shapes to fit into caves or crawl or like um, climb trees. But I don't think my, my guess about evolutionary biology is there's never been a point where it's like, okay, we're going to lay in this really awkward position for four <laughs> minutes. I don't think that that's a part of it. So I don't think you can compare the discomfort of running to the discomfort of yin and have it be a biologically sound um, argument on that level. That's interesting that you say that because um, I have a, my daughter, it's been a while since I've seen you in person, but my daughter's now eight and a half. <laughs> so I've watched her grow up from, you know, being a really active toddler to now mm -hmm. a kind of slothful tweenager. <laughs> and I have observed over... Don't let her read Twilight. <laughs> she liked Harry, and that's good. And when I it like got it. to the, like, teen angst part of Harry, she was done. <laughs> she good. <laughs> but um, I have observed her, even when she was pretty young, hanging out in shapes. Or maybe not four or five minutes, but for odd numbers of times. And I'll go downstairs and catch her watching a show. And, and she's, she's got the same hypermobility that I do. And she'll like have her feet up over her head. And she's just sitting there watching TV with her feet over her head. She's not seeing that for me because I don't practice that way much at all. I'm a very lazy yogi. So <laughs> that's probably saved me from the hip replacements because <laughs> I don't actually do the things that I can do. But, you know, I'll go in and I'll be like, what are you doing? You're hitting mm -hmm. your both feet over her head watching TV. So mm -hmm. I feel like even if it's not evolutionary beneficial to us, it's, it's not so uncommon for us to, if we know we're going to be still, to get mm -hmm. ourselves into weird positions for a while and hang out there. And then when that gets uncomfortable, we shift and go into another position and mm -hmm. hang out there. You know, I, I observe that in teacher training when no one can sit still. And, um, <laughs> you know, so I, I know that it's not 
there's no advantage to doing it, but I also observe that people do it. And, and that comes to this kind of, well, it kind of feels good when you're not doing it anymore. So you do it for a while and then you come out and then you're like, oh, that feels great. I'm not doing that thing anymore. <laughs> Um, so I, I don't I don't have an explanation for for why I've observed that when I look around the um, the world and I see how people behave when they're still. Um, but I have seen my daughter do yin poses on her own. So. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, so there's also <clears throat> there's also a movement of of conversation around the poisons of sitting recently. Yeah. And I'm standing right here as we, <laughs> as we record this. I just change my shape all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So MoveNet, uh, there's an organization called MoveNet. That has a really great handout. I don't know if they're still giving it out, but the handout is on all the different ways that, that you can sit comfortably. Mm. So, let me rephrase that. All the different ways that, are, are, that one could theoretically sit on the floor without using furniture that are natural ways of sitting where you can accomplish whatever you want to accomplish, whether it's sewing something or um, uh, grinding something or et cetera, et cetera. So humans have sat forever. We just haven't sat with chairs, mm. at least as often as we currently do, um, or many of us currently do. So the, the, the ability to sit and to take on a, a shape um, and then to change that shape comes from a place of inner authority. So you're just, nobody's telling you what to do. Um, you are, you know, finding whatever's comfortable for that moment and then you're moving on to something else. So there's in no way any kind of expectation that you would linger into discomfort for the purposes of changing mm -hmm. your joint structure. So I, I, I'm yeah. still in the camp that <laughs> it's, not, it's not something that we would have ever done naturally. Mm. Um, okay, but <laughs> I, it's okay to, I also think it's totally cool and totally okay to disagree about things and to have these really rich mm -hmm. thinking conversations because yeah. the yoga world doesn't necessarily need more people, like more people saying like, oh, don't do this, do that, mm -hmm. do this. Is that falls right into the line of authoritarianism that is probably deeply embedded in our, you know, epigenetics right now, mm -hmm. if not our genetic structure. Yeah. And yeah. Again, that's, that has lots of problems. So I have no desire to tell people don't do yin yoga. I think there's a whole uh, host of benefits that can come from yin yoga that are about um, non-physical uh, aspects, things like pr uh, presence, mm -hmm. things like that practice of self-inquiry where you do get down to the truth about, okay, I'm feeling the sensation and this is my time to shift and to use your own inner authority, your own inner teacher to... Um, practice like even having a space to practice using your own inner teacher to do something differently than what is being instructed in that moment or to use a prop when no one else in the room may be using a prop so there are quite a few reasons that are sort of beyond my quote-unquote scope of practice that i'm not getting into in terms of the benefits of yin yoga today but i want to talk because we're, we're doing this thing. Yeah. I just want to go ahead and draw a picture. I don't have, like, I wish I had an easel. I think I'd have one. <laughs> well, Where to store it in the one bedroom apartment? <laughs> this is a question, but I'm going to draw a picture and talk a little bit about like the hip joint and, mm -hmm. you know, some, some food for thought in terms of yen. Okay. So, all right, drawing. Okay, so here's roughly a, a, roughly a hip joint. Mm -hmm. This is the acetabulum, the socket, and this is the hip itself. And in a healthy joint, it has a couple of things that we don't talk about very much. First of all, there's two terms. One is osteokinematics. So this is what you can see. This is what we as yoga teachers can see. We can see bones moving in space. So osteokinematics of my right arm right now it is abduction as I reach it up and adduction as I bring it down. Inside the joint, something else is going on and that's called arthrokinematics. So inside the joint, there's something called arthrokinematics and arthrokinematics are, I'm gonna put the clipboard down for a moment, the, um, the fact that as the arm or the leg goes up, 
there has to be a little bit of a roll inside the joint, a roll, a slide, and a glide. Mm -hmm. Also, anytime you're exposed to forces, say somebody, you know, you bump into somebody on the sidewalk, or today I bumped into the door frame, <laughs> not the door frame, the, the vacuum that was on the floor. So you get these sudden jolts of, um, of unexpected movement and your joints have a little bit of play to them. They should be able to wiggle just enough that is part of the, the shock absorption system naturally inside of your body. And these are good things. Arthrokinematics is a good thing. You need it. Um, you need some healthy arthrokinematics, some rolls and glides and slides, and you need some uh, joint play in all of the joints. Now, if you have hypermobility, which uh, I'm going to put out a number, but there's there's not any research behind it, but I'm going to suggest that probably maybe half the people coming to yoga are landing in that upper 40% of, upper 30% of, <laughs> of mobile people. So it, it's not an average population. Let's just get back to that again. So most people coming to all types of yoga are self-selecting and they have more mobility than average. So um, you, you're, that means that most people coming to our classes, maybe not more than 50% in every population, but in many, many populations have currently or had in their past because after a certain age, everything, your tissues do become less mobile and your joints do become uh, more stuck in one place, but hypermobility, so excess laxity in the joints. Mm -hmm. So in a healthy joint, I'm going to bring my clipboard back up. You're, no matter what you do with your arm or your hip, this is the hip and the shoulder are good examples, the center of the, the joint is going to stay on axis. Mm -hmm. What you're asking in yin practice is for essentially you're asking, so let's say this is a, a left hip socket. It's on my, my left side. You're asking uh, if you go into Supta Baddha Konasana, so lay on your back with the soles of your feet together and the um, knees open wide in the diamond shape, you're asking for the hip, these ligaments on the inside to be, to be lengthened and for the joint to be slackened in one of many, many angles that the hip can go into. So the hip is a ball and socket joint and you're asking for these ligaments right here to lengthen. So what does that imply? in somebody who's hypermobile, who has a little hip mobility. Well, right here, there's gonna be bone on bone. Right, that's compression, right. And that's not a good thing. Right, and we, we teach that, and the, we, you know, we teach, you know, the target area is where you feel the tensile load. Mm -hmm. And then when you feel compression on the opposite side of the joint, which I do in Supta Baddha Konasana, um, because I no longer feel any, anything in my groins to hold that back. I feel that bone on bone compression. And then I also get the weight of my femurs and my knees pressing, pressing that whole joint into my SI. And then I feel, I call it, I've got my itis in my SI. <laughs> yeah, itis. <laughs> yeah, by the way, this is only the, the, place the first of multiple joints that are, that right. will be affected. So, so we yeah. tell people, if you are feeling compression and uh, discomfort, of any level on the opposite side of the target area, then prop it up and, and back off from that because you can't go any further when you've got bone on bone. What do you say to a brand new person, someone who's never done yin yoga before? Um, well, you know, you spent all this extra time in the poses to tell them all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. and so I do in my classes, I do teach that. I, I explain that mm -hmm. when we're in something like Supta Baddha Kanasa, the target area is the groins and we're looking to um, stretch out some of the tissue in the, in the groin area, the adductors. And if you feel sensation, the outside of rim of the hip, if you feel sensation pressing on the SI, and I tell them where that is because nobody knows, mm -hmm. then, you know, put something under your knees to lessen that load. So we do use props in yin um, to help people maybe they back off from sensation that's just too much like mm -hmm. some, you know most of the time we tell people if it's too much in your groins put a blanket underneath i take the extra step 
probably because I experienced myself and so I have a more sensitive idea about it. Um, prop to alleviate the sensation in the mm -hmm. compression area too. So um, we do, especially those of us who've trained with Paul, who spends a lot of time reinforcing this idea. Paul Grilly. Um, <clears throat> yeah, he spends a lot of time making sure, I mean, mm -hmm. it's a six day training. We're ta constantly talking about tensile load, compressive load, and yeah. taking off from the compression. So, so I, I would, if, if you came to my class and I was teaching that, I would, I would, I would probably never come around to adjust you because <laughs> I would have full confidence that you, Jen, know exactly yeah. what's going on. You've had days and days and days and days of training, but that's not going to happen for a yin yoga student. They're not going to get that level of reinforcement of the ideas and yeah. the experience with their body until they have, let's say you did a 40 hour training or 60 hour training or an 80 hour training. I mean, that would be 80 yoga classes. So it would be yeah. maybe two years into a weekly class almost. Um, so I, I think that, again, it, it's deeply problematic to rely on the self-report of sensation. Most people, not just most people are, are coming to yoga or hypermobile, but most people, period, these days are extremely disembodied. Yeah. And I look around my... and. Let me break that down because that's not a very scientific term. What I mean is that we have um, very little sense of what's called interoception or even to some extent um, kinesthetic sense. So interoception is an awareness, for example, like when you feel gassy, mm -hmm. that it's actually like your insides that it's <laughs> I was hanging out with some babies last night. Um, and so that awareness that something's going on in your digestive system would be a, an example of interoception. Another example would be an awareness of uh, your breath, whether you're belly breathing or rib breathing or chest breathing. Um, uh, an awareness, it, hopefully we're all familiar with the feeling of your bladder being full mm -hmm. um, and needing to go to the bathroom. But these are examples of interoception, but there's also much deeper levels of interoception, including pain reception. Mm -hmm. And when we are either instructed to ignore discomfort, we often don't, we will often develop very deep pain from the process, but not immediately. So down the line. Mm -hmm. And this I think is a problem with yoga uh, in terms of injury and pain creation is that we are not, you're not going to see an injury from a one hour yin class. Most likely you're not going to see an injury from a one hour vinyasa class. You're going to see injuries after people have become somewhat addicted to the to the yoga or they've been coming for weeks and weeks at minimum, usually six months to years is when people start to get discomfort. The student who's coming to my class, who's got the hip popping out of place or whatever is going on for her, she probably won't experience injury for another year or two, mm. but she's coming to classes, I don't know, three, four times a week and she's in love with it. And if I tell her like, you're going to hurt yourself, you need to see a physical therapist, she'll probably be skeptical thinking that I'm trying to promote my own business, which, yeah, get you know, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. I, I am almost always going to, I mean, with very few exceptions, there's some things we do within physical therapy that are called joint capsule releases that are kind of like yin, uh, yin yoga. But those are things that we do very often after surgery or very often mm -hmm. after a pretty um, intense reason for somebody to have fascial tightening. And, there are not things that I would ever teach to the general public without testing and retesting them first. Mm -hmm. So physiologically speaking, because of the drawing that I showed you, because of mm -hmm. the alteration that the, that's happening on the level of the joint mechanics, the arthrokinematics, because of the um, high number of people coming to yoga who are hypermobile, I'd, I'm not a fan of the passive stretches. And I think the research is, is showing that too, that actually passive stretching, especially prior to physical activity, can cause more harm than good. Yeah, we've seen those studies too. Um, so we do definitely, I don't know, I think most people don't even want to move very much after they've been in a class. <laughs> they kind of slowly float out of the room. Um, but the yin, so with the hypermobile people, you know, one of the things that um, 
you know, when you practice yin or any, any kind of yoga, really, if we stop practicing and we don't do it every day, we don't, we lose, we lose those gains. So if I don't do a hamstring stretch every single day, and I, I, you know, especially when I go on vacation and I don't do any yoga, <laughs> I come back after two or three weeks and I'm like, whoa, I lost some of my range. So we're, you know, we're constantly losing our gains. Um, and I've already said, I'm a, I'm a super lazy yogi. I don't, I don't try to maintain it. So I'm constantly backing up and, and trying to go forward again. Um, so is there something about hypermobile collagen that it either doesn't lose those gains or, um, does so, so much more slowly that maybe hypermobile people should just do less or less frequently or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there are two things going on. There are stretches that are designed. So a lot of the studies are uh, designed to measure muscle length mm -hmm. and they make, they're not necessarily, um, they're like a hamstring stretch study is, is looking at two joints, right? It's not even looking at one joint. So you're looking at the, the length of the muscle, not the length of the collagen fibers. And Muscle is contractile tissue, so it will inevitably contract in between stretching sessions. Uh, collagen, which makes up our ligaments or joint capsules, is not contractile tissue, and it doesn't contain um, the same level of elastin, and it won't bounce back. So you can essentially permanently deform collagen fibers, ligament tissue, and that's what you were saying. Like you no longer feel like if you took a couple of weeks off and then you did a supta baddha konasana again, you'd, you'd never feel it in the inner thigh, in the medial part of your thigh, no matter how long you waited. And that's because forever though, I've never had sensation there. So that's a you know this comes back to like the genetic capacities mm -hmm. of people too. Like I, that's never been a pose that did much for me in that area. So. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I, I don't see a reason to, to do it unless there is a precise yeah. angle that was just that you discovered with a skillful practitioner, such as a physical therapist yeah. to, um, to open up one part of your joint or like a left versus right discrepancy mm -hmm. to help uh, create more balance between sides. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a super fascinating conversation. I'm, I, as you can tell, I fall on the side of I can't see if I can't see a anatomic reason to practice yin yoga. I just really can't. Um, and I know and love Paul Grilly's DVDs, but his anatomy knowledge actually falls short in a couple of respects. Bone is constantly reforming, and so I'm thinking of like one of the examples that he gives where. Um, I think, I think the student's name is Bob and the arm is coming by the ear and the, I, I think so. It's like Ivy and Bob and Ivy's arm goes back and yeah. Bob's arm stops at before 90 degrees. Well, first of all, that is not even the, the main articulation that's happening. There's not even a joint, it's muscle tissue. And secondly, it's, um, there are multiple articulations happening. There's the pseudo joint of the scapothoracic, and then there's the glenohumeral joint, and then there's the lats, which go all the way down into the back, and the upper traps that go all the way into the neck, therefore. And so his instructions are actually limited in terms of their um, deeper understanding of anatomy. And, um, you know, I, I just, I'm just not happy with, with that being um, shared as a, a authoritative knowledge out there it's it has a lot of limitations to it especially the idea of compression and tension and that people can uh, feel that mm. he's that doesn't take away from uh his skill as uh instructor and but again like people are hurting themselves and i don't think yen is helping mm. so in your regular classes what mm -hmm. do you do to help people to um modulate even in a regular class, because I mean, I've been teaching almost 15 years and the mm -hmm. places where I see people get hurt are actually in my young classes and other people's young classes. I haven't, I haven't mm -hmm. seen anybody get hurt from a yin class. Mm -hmm. 
So well, again, we're not going to see the yeah. injuries for, for right. years but, potentially. But, um, but this is happening in yang yoga too. Yeah. So how do I, how do I, I, I only have a handful of minutes for you. I literally have to run yeah. out of my house, but, um, <laughs> but the, the things I do is I, I don't teach end range. So there's not going to be a class where I teach the splits, for example, yeah. because that would be inevitably end range um, in the hip sockets. I don't teach uh, <clears throat> even something, for example, like pyramid pose, which requires a significant amount of, uh, of range of motion in the front leg. I will always, if I'm going to teach that, I'm going to have two blocks available. Mm -hmm. I always mention almost universally, if I'm going to teach warrior one, if I'm going to teach half moon or any of these poses that have, that have been described historically triangle pose as stacking of the pelvis. I always instruct that your pelvis literally cannot stack that mm -hmm. you, you, you know, your goal right now is to stop where you start to feel the, the end and to take a micro bend in your front knee and look and make sure your knee is pointing directly over. So there's lots of anatomic cues that I'm giving within my classes that are sound. And even then, the clues, the, the cues that I'm giving don't always land with people, especially if they're trying, if they've heard other cues from mm -hmm. other yoga teachers, like stack your pelvis, like straighten your leg. Like I'll teach warrior three, for example, even, which is not an end range pose but I'll, for most people, but I'll teach it with a knee bent and the standing knee bent. Mm -hmm. And I'll teach um, half moon often with the standing knee bent so that you can actually be in muscular control rather than hanging your ligaments. There are a number of ways to take what we love as the practice of yoga and to make it safer. Yeah. But um, we're, you know, overriding lots of other instructions saying other things. So okay. it's a really complicated uh, scene that we're in. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Arielle, for taking time today to chat and, and mull over these considerations. Um, thank you so much. Give you an opportunity to let people know where they can find you online or in the world. <laughs> yeah. So I run two websites. The main one right now is yogaanatomyacademy.com. And I run through that website, facebook.com slash yoga anatomy academy. I have an Instagram account and I try to put lots of funny things up there. So you should follow it just for the humor. <laughs> um, and uh, that is where I run a 12 week mentorship in yoga anatomy and actually once you're in you're in for life so you can forever and ever join our weekly or monthly phone calls um zoom calls actually just like this one <laughs> and lots of other fun stuff and then sacredsourceyoga.com is more my personal site that i've had for over 10 years for my yoga teaching and for um, my physical therapy work that i do great well thank you thank and, you jen so much and have a wonderful rest of your day and and I'll see you soon, hopefully. <laughs> yes, thank you. The world needs more of these really interesting conversations. No, thank you, thank really you, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Take care.